So I'm honored and privileged really indeed to have uh, Professor Avi Leib from Harvard University back. So welcome back to the Parallaxis podcast, because as our viewers and listeners may remember, last year we had, a, I think, a very interesting discussion about Oumuamua and your book related to that, Extraterrestrial, which was released around that time in Hungarian as well. And, and for those of you who didn't read it yet, so please go and, 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 and buy the book because it's still, uh, still an amazing book. Uh, but since then, of course, in the last year, a lot of things have happened, also in your field, also about uh, searching for ex extraterrestrial artifacts, also in the projects which you are involved in, like the Galileo project, for example, which we didn't even mention last year because I guess then it didn't yet exist. Right, it didn't exist. And also, I should say there is a new book uh, that will come out in June 2023, where I will discuss the implications for humanity of everything that we will talk about. Oh, yes. Now, as for the implications of humanity, uh, well, in the past year, obviously, I, I mentioned that a lot of things have happened. And, and I think one of the most profound things that happened to all of us is that we keep hearing unimaginable, unimaginable statements from, from politicians, uh, in particular, at least one politician who is a head of a nuclear superpower, statements that we've never actually heard from anyone in the past 60 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so th this idea is that there may be some sort of a catastrophic or existential disaster like an atomic crisis or something else, a climate crisis or whatever crisis that, that humanity may well face, uh, is something, it doesn't seem to be that distant anymore as it seemed like one or two years ago. Well, it, and, makes, you, it makes you wonder whether we, our species is really intelligent because yes. we may inflict uh, wounds on ourselves that uh, are existential risks. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look... Um, uh, at the era of time in the universe, the universe started really simple. There was a soup of elementary particles early on, and uh, there were, it was nearly uniform, but the denser region eventually collapsed to make galaxies inside of which the gas fragmented into stars and planets, and life as we know it emerged on Earth, our planet, and uh, it features some of the most complex systems that we know about life. But it doesn't mean that the future will reflect the same progression, because if we are not intelligent enough, uh, eventually uh, we might destroy er all that is precious to us here on Earth. Uh, and the Earth will return to being simple. And the same actually holds for the universe at large, if you think about it, because we, over the past uh, five billion years, the expansion of the universe seems to be accelerating and all the galaxies beyond ours, far away from us, are receding away from us at an ever increasing speed. So the universe is accelerating its expansion. And eventually those galaxies will run out of our horizon. Even light will not be able to bridge the increasing gap between us and them. And so we will be surrounded by vacuum. That's the simplest future that you can imagine. So even though you start from a simple state, um, this is true for our life. You know, as infants, we are relatively simple. Then we become adults. We become much more complex. But the elderly resemble infants. We go back. Mm -hmm. We start from dust. We are made of that and we end up as dust. And so the only question is whether we will be responsible for going back to dust ourselves or whether we will let the sun boil off all the oceans of, on Earth in a billion years, some natural catastrophe. My recommendation is let's keep the party going for at <laughs> least a billion years. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a plan. However, of course, as we discussed, there is still this great filter over there, which you mentioned in your book. And of course, it raises questions whether it is whether there isn't a natural law of some sort that limits 
the the times the the lifespan of a civilization well, a technological it, it, civilization that's a very interesting point and in fact we we could do the statistics you see um most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun if you look at the star formation history of the universe uh it peaked about 10 billion years ago and the sun is only 4.6 billion years old so it's a late bloomer mm -hmm. and within a billion years the sun will boil off all the oceans on earth so we just have one billion years left for us and if the clock started ticking the technological clock started ticking uh, earlier billions of years ago on exoplanets by now those civilizations are not around uh, and we could potentially explore why they perished whether it was a natural catastrophe like the star sterilizing the habitable planet, or it was a self-inflicted wound, like mm -hmm. a nuclear war or um, some other uh, a climate change, or maybe uh, some uh, microbe, a virus uh, that was uh, created in the laboratory <laughs> for yeah. uh, biological warfare. And uh, so by doing the statistics on exoplanets, by the way, I think most of the civilizations that predated us are dead by now, obviously, because of some natural catastrophe, like the sun boiling off the oceans on their planet. And looking for radio signals is not the right way to find them. Yeah, it's just, just like waiting for a phone call from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He's not allowed around anymore, but you can look for what he left behind. And the same is true for those other civilizations, we can look for spacecraft that they sent out. And if they launch them with chemical propulsion, they would not move faster than the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. So they will be trapped in the Milky Way galaxy like a basket, keeping them together. Uh, unlike all the radio signals that those civilizations sent that by now reach the edge of the universe, we can't really see them. Um, so it's a completely different approach uh, doing um, interstellar space archaeology, basically looking for all the physical objects that were manufactured by other civilizations that were sent out, just like checking your mailbox instead of waiting for a phone call. For 70 years, we were waiting uh, for a radio signal, a phone call, but we didn't receive it, and I suggest let's check our mailbox in the backyard it may be maybe there is a lot of mail piling up in it oh yeah and and just uh, let me ask you something provocative and and i think even more even more out of the box uh question that uh, oh by the way i think the box is not in the right place it's not yeah. as if my my <laughs> arguments are out of the box my arguments are common sense it's just yeah, that the sure. box the box is not in the right place as, as it happened many times in the history of science before. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, it happens from time to time. And then you need to wait at least a, a paradigm shift, at least. Yeah, we and just I, need to move the box. It's not so difficult, by the way. Instead of investing $10 billion in searching for supersymmetry by smashing particles at very high energies in the Large Hadron Collider, we just need at 1% of the cost of that build telescopes that would monitor the sky and look for equipment sent by extraterrestrial civilizations. It's not Which so difficult. Which is precisely what you are doing in the Galilee. Yeah, we, we just need to look. Uh, that's all I'm saying. It's not so yeah. complicated. Absolutely. <laughs> now, okay, so the, 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 okay, well, the not so out of the box then, or maybe whatever, wherever the box is, but I think my question is still out of the box. You mentioned statistics. Uh, uh, now, clearly, as of now, because we didn't have this $1 billion budget yet and the time for that, uh, we, we can't really have an ensemble statistics of astrosociological uh, analysis. But we do, in, in physics, it happens many times, at least in the stationary systems, which which, which the Earth system may be, that, that ensemble statistics can be replaced by a long time average temporal statistics. So the question arises that how on Earth we know that here on this particular planet, there was not another technological civilization that evolved here in the past 4.6 uh, billion years. So again, I, I think it's a fil filter again that that if we would like die right now, the, the humanity would vanish from Earth from tomorrow on, 
just to think about what relics would be around in 100 million years, for example. Oh, uh, okay. So the best so place to search for it is actually not on Earth. Uh, although, um, you know, on Earth, we know that um, the surface of the Earth is mixed with the interior over sure. hundreds of millions of years. So if something happened very recently, you might find it. But a better place to search, actually, for evidence that humanity existed is on the moon. Mm -hmm. Because, well, there is a footstep on the moon. I mean, that may be erased eventually uh, by uh, micrometeorites. But, um, you know, uh, for example, if the Artemis uh, program uh, comes to fruition and uh, we establish some base on the moon, that footprint will stay there. There is no geological activity on the moon and there is no atmosphere on the moon. And uh, similarly on Mars. So, um, you know, we should search these surfaces if there is any evidence for equipment that either came from Earth before us or that uh, crashed on the surfaces of these objects from an exoplanet, from far away, um, which is a possibility because it takes half a billion years to traverse the entire Milky Way galaxy with chemical rockets. OK, mm -hmm. and uh, since I said most stars formed billions of years before the sun, there was plenty of time for that to happen. We just need to check. That's all. Now, um, it, it's quite likely that there was nothing like us on Earth, um, uh, but we should, uh, you know, look at it empirically rather than assume. Uh, I mean, it's a very natural tendency for humans to uh, argue that we are at the center of the universe, that uh, we are very important actors in this cosmic play. My point is, the cosmic play started 13.8 billion years ago. We just came at the end. And based on what Galileo Galilei and uh, Copernicus told us, we are not at the center of the stage. So if you are not at the center of the stage and you come late to the play, the play is not about you. <laughs> and you better search for other actors who can tell you what the play is about. Yeah. Uh, okay. But okay. Just uh, coming back to our long distance future or long term future, which hopefully is waiting for us out there. But still, as as I mentioned in the introduction, yes, we all feel the non negligible risk of a catastrophic or existential disaster that may destroy, wipe out our civilization or our culture even if the species itself would survive. Now, in a recent paper by you and, and two colleagues of yours that, that, that I managed to run into on the internet, actually, is proposing something that you refer to as a lunar backup record for humanity, which, right. again, has to do with the moon. Now, I guess we can all understand why, because of the lack of this, uh, I don't know, uh, plane tectonics and whatever. But but so the idea is just to ke keep a, a record or a backup uh, storage, a cloud, if you wish, of all human knowledge, or at least that part of human knowledge and information that is that we find worthwhile to preserve, uh, and and to keep it on the moon for a very yeah. long time. So please please, uh, this is a fascinating idea. Yeah, but I got the. Uh, it's it's not an, an original idea. I got the idea when I purchased a laptop over the summer and. Uh, I was advised by my postdoc to get also a backup system uh, just in case. And it's a small box that you connect to the laptop and um, record all the important uh, documents there so that if something bad happens to the laptop, if you spill some coffee on it, you still have everything backed up. And so I thought to myself, why don't uh, we do the same given uh, the ambitions of Putin and uh, the risks that we face, all the existential risks. and um, the moon is an ideal platform, uh, first because uh, NASA has the Artemis program where uh, the plan is to establish a sustainable base, human base, on the moon. So there will be people there. And um, it's not very expensive to have a backup system and uh, place it there and basically load it with uh, all the information that we find important. For example, um, all the human-related uh, innovation, information, uh, uh, books, music, uh, all creations of humans uh, can be easily stored. 
Uh, all uh, genetic information about all life forms on Earth can be stored. Um, and then it could be updated on a regular basis. Uh, in difference from the golden record that uh, accompanied Voyager, where you know it's just um, a fixed amount of information. And also, it's information that I'm not particularly proud of. I don't like the music of the 60s. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I mean, my wife loves it, but... Yeah, I, I always like like the cutting edge. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, being able to update it is really essential for us to be proud of what we do. Just to give you an example, New Horizons, this um, spacecraft that was, was sent to study Pluto, uh, had a box, a small box, with 30 grams of the ashes of Clyde Tambow, the scientist who discovered Pluto. And I thought to myself when I heard about it, I said, that makes no sense because these ashes are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. They contain no information. And so what is the purpose of burning up the genetic information on a scientist whom you want to commemorate? Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm, I'm really ashamed of this box. So if extraterrestrials find it, they would think that we are a very aggressive, uh, civilization with very primitive rituals, burning up the DNA of a person that we want to commemorate. And so I would suggest that we send a spacecraft moving faster than New Horizons uh, so that it go ahead of it and apologize for this box. <laughs> <laughs> but um, right. uh, we can do just to preserve our uh, the things that we are really proud of up to date, uh, we can all store it on the moon. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the, the Voyager Golden Record, and I happen to know John Lamberg, who who is who is one of those who created it together with Carl Sagan. Of course, the whole thing was Carl Sagan's idea, but he was the artist involved, and 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 he actually commented on your proposal on Facebook, and he said, uh, I, I think it's interesting. By the way, just before you, you mention it, I should say yeah. that uh, there is an illustration of a man and a woman, and that was before being fit was considered fashionable. So even <laughs> uh, by the, today's standards, this, this illustration is not but something to be proud of. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But any, anyway, it was just more like, I, I, certainly according to John Lamberg, is, it was more like an artistic project of some sort. Okay. I mean, certainly for him as an artist, but, but he has an interesting point about your proposition of storing the, the backup on the moon. It says, if Earth is so heavily damaged that this is required, space travel will instantly stop and the backup will be inaccessible. So so he he says this may just be a little more than an emotional security blanket. Oh, no, no. The, the <laughs> but, okay. So the point is that this is based on the idea that there will be some people on the moon. Okay. So, yeah, we, are, uh -huh. so we are planning to have a sustainable base there. And so there will be some people able to operate right. the equipment that uh, keeps this record and hopefully they will be able to resurrect uh, what we care about. Now, of course, there, there, there is a bunker under the White House somewhere, uh, <laughs> where, but that bunker preserves politicians in Washington DC and they do not represent necessarily the best that the human DNA has to offer. <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Now, okay, uh, uh, okay. It, it, it's it's so far so good. Now, one question about that 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 you are proposing in your paper that the way to update this this backup on the moon would be via laser communication, or in any case, some sort of electromagnetic waves. Now, of course, these waves. I I, I realize that in case of laser is good because it is is it is really focused. Right. But but in in any case, some sort of electro, some part of the radiation will be radiated away, which means that if we upload such a sensitive information as the entire entire human knowledge and DNA, don't we have a fear that uh, uh, some other civilization out there, if there are, will get this information? Well, keep keep in mind that this information is nothing new. We are just. Uh, uh, keeping uh, the information about what is already happening on Earth, and uh, they could easily trace that if they send probes to Earth or mm -hmm. just listen to all the transmissions. I mean, if you just look at social media, in particular Twitter, there are a lot of things that we would rather not uh, transmit. 
yeah, sure. because uh, then we would lose our status as an intelligent civilization. <laughs> um, I think yeah. if you make a, a ranking, uh, we are probably not at the top of the class. You know, I tell students in my class at Harvard, I say, half of you are below the median. <laughs> this is just a statistical fact, irrespective yeah, of how smart you are. Half of the students in any class are below the median. And By definition. They, they get really upset because they come to Harvard <laughs> thinking that they are geniuses. Uh, but half of them are definitely below the, I mean, there is no doubt about it. And if we were to ask where we stand as a civilization, I wouldn't uh, put my bets uh, high that we are near the top. I would say we are somewhere in the middle. Uh, so don't worry about it. They are much smarter. They would figure it out. Uh, what we need to do is improve ourselves and learn from them. You see, my main reason for seeking intelligence in space is because I don't often find it here on Earth. And uh, I want to learn from them. So just imagine how much innovation. And if we had a leap forward uh, by which we will see gadgets that were produced over millions of years by advanced technologies, we would save time. We would find answers to problems that we haven't yet figured out. Just to give you an example, the universe, okay? So there are people paid to think about the universe. These are called cosmologists. I'm one of them. Uh, and the most elementary thing you would ask, okay, what is the universe made of? What is most of the matter in the universe? That's simple, right? We don't know. For a century, we've been looking around, trying to figure it out. We call it dark matter. How? You know, it's really surprising that cosmologists are being paid because they don't know what they're talking about in, in a way. I mean, we are talking about some substance that is not found in the solar system. And there is an interesting lesson here because, you know, we always think that what we find around us represents the universe at large. And that's why we thought that we are at the center of the universe. My daughters thought that they're at the center of the universe until they went to the kindergarten, obviously, and they saw the world is much bigger than their home. And uh, uh, But we also think that everything that makes up the universe is what we find here, and that's wrong. The dark matter is evidence for that. 83% of all the matter in the universe is of a different nature, and we haven't found what it is yet. And um, I say, you know, let's keep looking because also, the first three interstellar objects that entered the solar system appear to be weird. Uh, that includes two meteors that my student Amir Siraj and I found, uh, one from 2014 and one from March 2017. And it also includes uh, Oumuamua, the object that I discuss in my book, Extraterrestrial. And the first two interstellar meteors are uh, uh, made of material that is stronger, tougher than iron, based on where they exploded in the atmosphere. And we don't know what this material is, and we are planning an expedition to Papua New Guinea to scoop the ocean floor and look for the fragments of this meteor and figure out what it's made of. And I made a promise to the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, if we find a, an artificial gadget that represents advanced technologies for us, I will bring it for a display in the Museum of Modern Art, because for us, it would represent modernity. For whoever sent it, it's ancient history. And so the bottom line is, the objects that we saw coming into the solar system appear unusual, outliers, relative to all the rocks that we had seen in the solar system before. Just like the dark matter is a substance that we don't see in the solar system. So we should be open-minded. You know, what we find in our backyard is not what the universe is made of. Thank you very much for the absolutely inspiring, as always, discussions. And uh, once more, we can't wait to see what you find in Papua New Guinea, of course, and can't wait to read your new book that is coming out, at least yeah. in English. The title, title is Interstellar. Oh, and uh, the previous one was extraterrestrial. Yes. And so a few days ago, I wrote to my publisher and said, well, if I do a trilogy, the next one would be intergalactic. No. OK, <laughs> so we'll be, I hope we'll be around to read that as well <laughs> and talk to you about that in due time. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. 
nem volt elég a tudományból és a fantasztikumból? Olvasd a parallaxis.emtv.hu, lájkold a Facebook oldalunkat, nézd a YouTube csatornánkat, és hallgassd a szokolébresztőt a Tilos Rádióban. A Tudományos Újságíró Klubja és a Tudományos Ismeretterjesztő Társulat által a Juhari Zsuzsanna díj külön díjával jutalmazott blog podcastjét az MD Media készítette. Kreatív producer Horváth Ádám Tamás. Hamarosan jön a következő rész.